You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast featuring some of Indiana's most fascinating men and women whose impact has shaped our state, our communities, and us. Join us as we discuss their imprint on our history. Leaders and Legends is brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated, your local veteran business enterprise specializing in public relations, media relations, public outreach, crisis communications, and digital photography. My name is Robert Bain, Principal of Veteran Strategies, former Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Greg Ballard, and Communications Director for the Indiana Republican Party. I'm honored to be your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel and Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guest today is Ray Tolbert, captain of Indiana University's 1981 National Championship team, first round draft pick, and I believe gold medal winner in the Pan Am Games. And he's doing great work today in the private sector, and we're going to talk a little bit about that as well as his playing career. We appreciate your time, Ray, and are excited for today's conversation. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Pleasure to be here. When did you begin to think that you had a special talent in basketball, talented enough and willing to work hard enough to make it not only to the premier basketball school in the country, but also to the National Basketball Association? Um, Great question to lead off with. I think uh, when I was in the sixth grade here in Anderson, Indiana, uh, I was about six feet tall. and But I was very uncoordinated, kind of goofy-like, you know, just, just a kid. And um, the first time I got a chance to play basketball, um, organizationally speaking, was probably in the fifth grade. I wasn't really good. I I didn't really want to try to work at it. But by the time I continued to grow and got to the sixth grade, and then by the time I was a seventh grader, um, I dunked the ball for the first time. And I think once I put that ball in the hole like that, that kind of (laughs) changed my mindset. And people were saying, man, you know what, you, you got a chance to be this. And a lot of people said I had good potentiality. There was, of course, there was haters that said, man, you're not going to be nothing, this and that. I said, well, I guess well, I might just prove you all wrong. And so by the time I got to, by the eighth grade, I could see myself doing some good things because a lot of the high school players were looking at me saying, okay, got a young buck coming up here. And by the time I was a freshman, Back when I played, because you know, being a freshman, you were not allowed to play on the varsity. But I figured that I'll get a chance to do something good. And so Phil Buck, my high school coach at the time, was kind of keeping his eye on me. And I, I started developing. By the time I became a sophomore in high school, I figured that now is the time for me to start to excel. So I started working out, running, lifting weights. I got better at my craft. I could score, rebound, pass, defend. I was like the, the Anderson, Indiana Magic Johnson. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I felt really good uh, about my potentiality. And, of course, you know, with any, anything you do athletically, you're going to have some ups and downs. But for me, it, it was kind of like a cakewalk because I enjoyed it so much. I put so much into it. I just want to get better and better. And so – uh, I think that's when it started happening for me. By the time I was, overall, by the time I was in seventh, eighth grade, I think I had a chance, uh, and I just worked at it and got better. Yeah. Was that first dunk a one hand or a two hand? Because you know, a two hand flush. It, it was a one hand, you know, but um, <laughs> I I have extremely large fingers, and big hands, so um, I, I threw it down. You know, in my mind, it was it was pretty awesome. But <laughs> by the time I became a freshman, I was doing all kind of dunks. So, <laughs> so yeah. But that, um, when you were when you were in high school, grade school, junior high, and high school, mm-hmm. it, it's fair to say that back in the class, back in the time, excuse me, of single class basketball, that there was no bigger sporting event 
in Indiana, except for the 500, that the, the boys high school basketball tournament was so massive and so popular. What was it like to be a part of that, especially at a time when the Anderson team and the Anderson area was so powerful? Yeah, uh, well, in Anderson, you know, we have at, at Anderson High School, our rivals. I went to Anderson Madison Heights. There was Anderson Indians, and there was the Anderson Highland Scots. And all three of our teams usually played in the wigwam, which held almost 10,000, second largest high school gym in the, in the country, uh, Newcastle being the, the, the largest. So every time we had a game there, it was packed sold out we had the fire marshal had to kick people out and <laughs> so we we were used to the big stage you know and and uh but it was every game was like a sectional and then when the sectionals came around you know anderson highland madison heights alexandria lapel um Delville, blackford i mean all these teams you know you had you had you had your elite and you had your like you said it wasn't class back then but Everybody went to these games knowing that the outcome was going to be inevitable. But then again, you might have that one Milan team that will come out of nowhere and, and make things happen. So the nostalgia of it all, the thrill of it all, just being able to play against some of the top players and, and not, and you know, not so great teams, but they all had a chance. And I think that's what made the uh, high school basketball tournament so exciting. But now, of course, like you said, going to class, I think it's, it, it kind of took away some of the thunder. But I think then again, looking at it from a different perspective, some other schools, the smaller schools, would never have gotten a chance to get to these these top elite um, sectionals, regional, semi-states, and states more often than not without the class. But I I just think for me personally, I enjoyed the the – just single eliminations, you know, not different classes, just just having the game played the way it should be played. If you were good enough to play and make it through, great. If not, hey, see you next year. <laughs> you <know>? but, <laughs> well, um, you, a I, few minutes ago, you mentioned the haters, yeah, which, yeah. which I understand, of course. But mm-hmm. is it somewhat ironic that probably the biggest group of haters lived within 15, 20 miles of you? Well, of course, yeah. <laughs> we we used to have um, particular stars or guys, potential guys from different high schools, from different um, counties, different uh, like Marion, Muncie, Fort Wayne, um, not necessarily Newcastle, but Muncie and Indianapolis. We used to go and just play on different courts just to see who wanted to play with them, you know, and they would always come to Anderson to – what we call Hazelwood, which is like, you know, on Madison Avenue, which is where most of our games were played on the courts. That's how you learn how to really play the game, not in the schools, but on the courts. And so guys would come and challenge us. And that's how I really developed my game. But the haters would always come around. <laughs> oh, man, you just call. You can't play. And then I said, okay, well, let's you know, throw it up. Let's go. And then by the time the games were over, they said, man, this dude's good. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they just they just added fuel to my fire, man. They just motivated me to get better. And so I, I thank my haters for, for saying what they said and just made me a better player. So I appreciate it. <laughs> Can you think, maybe recall, give us two or three names here on the Leaders and Legends podcast of of people you played against in high school and some of your, either your biggest rivals or someone you played and you went, man, this guy is good. Well, I remember one particular uh, player from Muncie North. And you may have heard this name. I'm, I'm sure that the, the people who grew up around the time I did back in the seventies, um, a guy by the name of Sammy Drummer, Sammy Drummer could play any sport. You, you throw him out there on a court or football field, he would excel. He was that good. He was about 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. He was bow-legged. And I, I guarantee you, <laughs> if, if, you, if you would put him – God rest his soul, he's passed away now. But if you would put him next to a guy – let's see. Um, what's the kid that just played for Duke? And um, he, he was the number one draft this past Zion. Uh, Zion Williamson. Zion Williamson. He, he and Zion could be brothers. 
that's how he he looks just like this guy. But but Zion's left handed, but Sammy Drummer was right handed. This kid could shoot, jump, run, pass, dribble, and he would show no emotion. He was he was like a Tim Duncan like, but he would he would give you thirty, and you wouldn't even you couldn't even see it coming. He was that good, and they were like the number one, number two team in the state the years he played. And then Madison Heights, the team I played for, we had a pretty good, decent a bunch of guys, too. We had Chris Falker, John Watson. Um, we had played Oliver Brooks, and we had Steve Tweed. We had Steve Turner, uh, Tom Jones. I mean, guys that I, I played, Herbie Terry, Michael B. Davis. Um, just just a bunch of guys that I played with, but the guys that I, I really thought outside of us um, um, from Highland. Well, let me let me start with Anderson. I mean, there were so many different good players: Roy Taylor, Tony Marshall, Bobby Johnson, Chucky e. Pugh. Um, just to name some of those guys from Anderson. I mean, even now you know you got Troy Lewis, those guys that played after me. Highland had Rick Lance, Kempy Sanders, um, Dave Poole great players from just our our area but outside you had marion you had the um um the jovan price jordan price you had the mark smith you had to keep the, the people all must had good players i mean god i can talk about this all day we had guys <laughs> from fort wayne that were good i mean everybody see back then what you gotta understand robert back then we didn't have PlayStation. We didn't have Madden. We didn't have all that. We just had basketball and football. We played outside and we excelled. That's why you have a a very rare um, amount of people who are who would excel in in sports now because they put the time in. Now they just sit behind a television or sit in front of a television, twiddling their thumbs and not really learning the game the way it should be. You know, it, it's not about. In, in NBA 2K, <laughs> you got to get out there and, and perform and you know, hone your craft. But nowadays, you got a few players like a Michael Jordan, LeBron James, you know, Kawhi Leonard, and all those guys, Dirk Nowitzki, those guys who stand out, they put in the time. I mean, I, I like this kid that's playing for Dallas now. You know, he, he's from, I don't know if he's from, he's from overseas. Right. Uh, this kid, he's going to be special. You know, and he, he he's he's like a, a mix between LeBron and, and Larry Bird. I mean, he's that good. Magic. He can bring the ball. He's six seven. Kid is good. And so I look at players like him. He says the game is easy because he put the work in, and people can't figure it out. Zion Williamson put the work in. When you put the work in, good things are going to happen. So yeah, but all these guys I mentioned playing in this region, this area. I haven't even mentioned Indianapolis, of course. Oh, my God. Well, Indianapolis well that's what I was so going to ask you about. Yeah. <laughs> is, and, and you, I think you were referencing uh, Luka Doncic from the, the point guard from the Mavericks. Exactly, yes. Who Luka, everyone yes, is exactly. in love with. But you you played with some amazing high school players when you mm-hmm. went to IU. But did yeah. you play against any of them while you were in high school? A Mike Woodson, Randy Whitman, uh, Ted Kitchell. That, do you remember I, I, coming up against them in high school, or did you really just kind of meet them as you went you to college? What? That's a great question. The only one that I remember playing against um, was a former teammate in college was Phil Eisenbarger, who actually played with at Muncie North with Eric Eckelman. He played with uh, Mike Durson and, and and Dave, which is Dave Durson's um, younger brother. Dave played oh, for yeah. the Chicago Bears. Yeah. And so Mike was a he was a monster too, man. Um, so Sammy Drummer, Phil Eisenbarger, and I played against each other. And um, I don't remember uh, playing against anybody else. Steve Risley played for Lawrence Central. He played football and basketball. But we never got a chance to play against them. I never played against Whitman, Kitchell, Landon Turner, uh, Mike Wilson, um, Don Cox. They played for Broad Ripple. Never, never played against those guys. For whatever reason, I don't know. But uh, the only guy I played with uh, against in college was in high school to college was Phil Eisenbach. And that, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I've never had that question asked before. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. For, thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> did, did you beat Eisenberger and then get to talk smack the whole time you were at IU together? Well, actually, Phil and those guys beat us. They, they must be North beat us. Um, 
they were that good, man. I, I told Phil, I said, had you, if we played on our court, and you, we weren't playing against uh, three other referees, I think we would have beat you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that Phil, Phil was tough, man. Phil was tough back in high school. But uh, by the time we got to got to college and we got on that court, I had to show Phil what time it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the problem is though, you can never. You know, one thing I learned in playing sports, especially when I played in the military, was was if you lose one game or you lose to someone and you never have a chance to beat them, then you're going to hear about it the rest of your life. That's true. Yeah. So I'm sure Phil, if you called him today, would be like, hey, Ray, do you remember that time our team whipped your team back in 1978, <laughs> whatever? But uh, believe it or not, Phil, Phil would never do that. But, but um, he had chances to do it, but he, I think he, he knew – he probably thought differently because he figured, well, I, I could crash him in, uh, in college. <laughs> well, and that's, that's true. It's one of the things that's interesting when you read or watch, and then we'll, we're going to go back because we want to talk about you being uh, Mr. Basketball for the state okay. of Indiana, the highest mm-hmm. honor there is for a high school basketball player. But it's interesting when you look at interviews – watch or read interviews or conversations with Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, and you played against Mag- Magic Johnson, that the, the pain of Larry Bird's loss to Magic Johnson is still in his face when he oh, has yeah. to talk about it. And Magic's glee and joy in beating Larry is still on his face when he's asked about it. Oh, is yeah. that something that you <laughs> personally experience when you run up against college or high school or pro rivals? You know, if, if you if you walked up to someone who played on North Carolina's team in 1981, or you run up against someone who played for Maryland, which would have been Albert King or Buck Williams or whatever, mm-hmm. is that the first thing you think of? And that's something that you're like, this is going to be on their mind from the moment we shake hands to the moment we leave. Um. Yeah, I guess it depends on the individual um, because, like, when I played uh, in the college against some of these former guys, Larry Nance from Clemson, they beat us. But on the last – I had a chance to tip the ball in on the last second shot. It, it went – I tipped it too hard. That that haunted me. The day when I lost to Kentucky at home, it was 62-62 with two minutes and 22 seconds to go. Isaiah Thomas threw me a perfect lob, and I tried to break the rim, and the ball slipped out of my hand at the last second, and it went hit the hit the other side of the rim, bounced up about thirty feet. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we lost that game. I, I, every time I see Sam Boy, I think about Sam Boy. Um, I think about that loss, and uh, of course, you know, on the other side of it, you know, playing against Maryland. Ironically, when I was drafted in the first round. Uh, to the New Jersey Nets, which I couldn't understand because they had drafted Buck Williams and Albert King from the same team from Maryland. And I'm thinking, why am I here? And so I wasn't there alone, but I got drafted by them. And uh, it, it was a rough go. <laughs> so, yeah, there, there, are, there are times when, you know, you see like a Sam Perkins. I would run into a Sam Perkins. I, when I played with L.A., I, I saw James Worthy. And even though I played – against Magic in college, you know, Magic was the only, Michigan State was the only team that beat us three times uh, his sophomore year, I believe. Mm -hmm. Well, his freshman year, he beat us twice. And, and of course, then the sophomore year, we played them three times because we had a tournament out in the Far West Classic in Portland, Oregon. And uh, Magic and Kelsey beat us then. And those guys were tough, man. And I could never beat Magic. Never beat Magic in college, and I, and I, I never, I never won at uh, Purdue. You know, and uh, guys that we played against um, at Purdue, we're all still good friends to this day. You know, but um, the rivalries were were intense, but the friendship would never would, would, would never go away. So, but yeah, man, great questions. There are so many guys that I played with and against, and now. I see them see them today after we all retired. We know we kind of laugh and kid about it, but yeah, some some of those some of those guys take it very personally. They take it very seriously. Yeah, man, we used to kill you guys. I'm like, why you want to bring up? Why you want to bring that up again? Oh, come on. <laughs> so, but Herb Williams, I mean Clark Kellogg, Ohio State. 
they have some great players. I mean, every Big Ten uh, team that we played against, from Iowa to Northwestern to Purdue, I mean, you name them, man, everybody had great players. And so um, you, you have to respect that. Big Ten was no joke back then. I mean, it's, it's still pretty a, a tough conference, but back then, when the rules the rules were different back then, man, you, you, you got physical. If you, did, if you didn't bring your A game, the games you were expected to win, you could get upset any day. Illinois was tough. Eddie Johnson, you know, Mark Smith, um, Levi Kyles. I mean, Eric Eric Holcomb. There's just so many guys that you can name from those those eras. Um, uh, even Iowa, Steve Crasses and Steve Wade, Ronnie Lester. Um, um, man, Big Tree. I mean, there's just so many guys. Joe Barry Carroll from Purdue. You name them, man. We 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 have some great players. And so I guess I'm just throwing names out there because I'm kind of reminiscing myself here. But it's, it's always good. It's an honor to be able to play against such great talent. And, you know, for me to win so many prestigious awards during that era uh, is very fulfilling. So I appreciate all that. Yeah. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel and Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bowes, McKinney and Evans and the Bowes Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest today is 1977 Indiana Mr. Basketball and 1981 national champion and captain, Ray Tolbert. What was it like to be recruited by Coach Knight? You came in (laughs) just a year or so after the undefeated national championship team. You clearly were someone who had options as a a six-foot-nine Indiana Mr. Basketball, you probably could have gone almost anywhere you wanted. And certainly I would imagine that Coach Knight's reputation, not only for winning, but also for being relatively demanding, uh, preceded his visit to your home and your decision to go there. What's that process like and what made you choose Indiana and to play for the Coach Knight? Looks like you did your homework. <laughs> great, great question. Um, believe it or not, um, IU was not my first choice. My first choice was Purdue. And my second choice was Michigan State. And then on down the line, um, I was looking at Wichita State. I was looking at uh, UCLA. And I-, I wanted to actually play out of state in Louisville. Louisville was very high on my list. But, um, you know, during the recruiting process, Louisville had an assistant coach come to my house about 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. He got lost. And come to find out, this particular assistant coach smelled like alcohol. (laughs) And my mother and father in ministry did not appreciate that at all. And so I said, well, looks like I won't be going to Louisville. (laughs) So, and so then... um, when we were playing at the Wigwam, we mentioned earlier about the Wigwam and, and, and this nostalgia there. Uh, we were playing against Highland, I believe. I had scored 44 points after that game. I was very happy, of course. But I didn't really realize how many points I had. I just wanted to win, beat the rivals. And um, at that, I found out later that Fred Childs, who was the head coach at Purdue at that time, Roger Bray- Blaylock and George Favor, who owns B. Windows now, um, they came to the game, and they were sitting on one end of the of the gym. And then I heard that Bobby Knight and Bob Donawald were on the other end of the gym. And so after the game, you know, we have in the locker room and everything, having fun, celebrating. <clears throat> and then Fred Schaus had walked in, and assistant coaches. And, you know, I went to all the Purdue basketball camps. I, I knew some of my best friends to this day, Walter Jordan, Frank Kendrick. Um, Great guys, you know. Um, I, I talked with Arnett Hallman a lot. I mean, all these guys I played against, even Joe Barry Carroll, you know, we're good Facebook friends. So 
I, I try to friend everybody, you know, because I'm, I'm that type of person, that personality. But getting back to it, Fred Shouts had walked into the, the gym, the, the locker room, and said, Ray, great game. I said, thanks, coach. I said, looking forward to, you know, coming to Purdue. He says, great. We we'll, we'll look forward to having you there, too. And then everybody went back to, you know, laughing and kidding and joking. And all of a sudden, it got real quiet in the, in the locker room. Here comes Bobby Knight, <laughs> stepping hard, rolling up his sleeves. He, Walking this, tall. This, yeah, this is no lie. This is what he said to me. He says, Tolbert, you're going to Indiana, and we're going to win a championship. See you later. Turned around and walked out. That was it. I was like, this man is crazy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, and because um, things happened in the Indiana All-Star game. I was Mr. Basketball, he said, 77. And, you know, we had about four or five guys on the team that felt like they should have been Mr. Basketball. So there was a lot of dissension on the team. You Who know, were those people? Who were those players? Uh, well, I, I tell you what. I'm going to let you go back and do your homework. And uh, I, I don't like to name names, but um, 1977 Indiana All-Stars, there was about four or five people on that team who thought they should have been Mr. Basketball. And uh, <laughs> it was tough. It was tough. And it, it wasn't – because what you got to understand is, you know, we lost both games to Kentucky at Freedom Hall there, and we lost at the uh, in Marcus Square Arena. You know, I scored like 19 points in one game, 21 points – the other game, we lost both games to Jeff Lamp, Lee Raker, and the guys from Kentucky. And nobody's going to remember all the other players, but they're going to remember the Mr. Basketball. And so my name was always up up, up in the air, you know. It, it got to a point where everybody thought I had a bad problem. I had an ego problem. I was a negativity guy. I was not. Even, I don't know if you remember, a, a, a famous referee in the Big Ten named Charlie Fowdy. Charlie Fowdy made a bet with Bobby Knight. He said, I wouldn't last a month at Indiana University. Well, like I back, back going back to the haters, I had to prove him wrong too. And <laughs> Coach Knight knew that, I, that that was not my personality. And, and, and it's evident now that when I played for four years, people still remember the exuberance, the enthusiasm, and the hard play that I, that I presented on the court. But I had to prove myself even from – junior high, high school, to college, you know. So I was always in a state of proving myself. And <laughs> so, but like I said, those tests, trials, and tribulations come to make you strong. And so that's pretty much why I'm in ministry today because of those things. God was just preparing me for what's happening. But anyway, yeah, man, so Bobby Knight, he, he signed me uh, because, of, because Purdue had signed some guys that I wasn't really fond of on our all-star team. So to get back at them, I went to IU. And Coach Knight has said, you're going to Indiana and we're going to win a championship. See you later. It, true story. And, <laughs> and, did, and I believe that, obviously, but did it did it matter? Did he come to your house again? Or, I mean, that can't be well, his only recruiting yes, pitch. Yes. yes, Coach Knight did come to my house, I think, once or twice. And he was very cordial, very nice at the time <laughs> because he, he really respected my mom and my dad. And, uh, <clears throat> but what really, what really got me as far as, you know, listen to what Coach Knight had to say, what he had to offer, the man never lied. He says, you're not guaranteed to start. You may not play. But I will guarantee you one thing. You will get an education, and you will be the best basketball player that you can possibly be. And that's, that, that stood out. I'm like, man, this dude might be crazy, but he, he makes sense. <laughs> and because he was honest, you know. And my mom and dad, you know, of course, in ministry, you know, they, they believe in honesty. And there's one thing that I can remember about Coach Knight. When he says something, you better take it to the bank. You know, his famous line was, he's either my way or the highway. Well, a few players packed their bags and went on the highway, but. <laughs> but, uh, but but you stayed and got the ring. So, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let me let me ask you a quick question, because you mentioned sure. a few minutes ago you were considering Michigan State. Yeah. And if you had gone to Michigan State, you would have been, I believe, a sophomore on the uh, 79 championship team. Exactly. And, 
you mentioned uh, a couple minutes ago that you were considering Louisville, which had just yeah. hired uh, Denny Crum. Yes. And you would have been a junior on their 1980 championship exactly. team. So heading Purdue. into 1981, you see your other two choices or possible choices, both win national championships. Are you thinking, I screwed up, I should have gone there, or damn it, I'm going to work really hard to make sure I win one this year? Well, you know, going back to Michigan State, when I played in the McDonald's All-American Classic uh, in Landover, Maryland, uh, we had Gene Banks, Magic Johnson, Wes Matthews, myself, Wayne McCoy. You know, um, there was um, Rutland, Jeff Rutland. I mean, there were so many great players. Jeff Lamp was there, Eddie Johnson. We had so many great players, and Magic was always, you know, Magic was Magic trying to sing and this and that. But uh, he didn't realize that I could sing, too. And I think he got a little jealous there. <laughs> so we, 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 we kind of compared and you know became good friends. And he realized that I had a lot of potential. I could do a lot of things that he did. But, you know, when I was in high school, I, pr- I pretty much did a lot of things, too. And I averaged a triple-double my senior year, you know, with a mediocre team. You know, we only won 13 games my senior year because I was going to go to Edison High School but anyway, that's another story we get to later, maybe. But so Magic Johnson and I became good friends, and uh, we had talked about, you know, but I, I had already committed to going to Indiana, but I never signed the letter of intent yet. So we had talked about maybe me potentially coming to Michigan State because he knew that I could play. But, yeah, getting back to that, had I went to Michigan State, yeah, I would have been playing with Magic Johnson, Bo Charles, uh, Jay Vincent, Sam Vincent, um, this Berkowitz, there's um, so many great players on that team. Of course, Greg Kelson, you know, 79, that could have been me, right? Going to Louisville, 1980, uh, that could have been me, yes. Purdue, 79, in the NIT championship we won, Purdue was the runner-up. And then the next year, Purdue went to the Final Four in 80. So, Either way, I would have did okay with these selections, but I chose to go to IU because, you know, that year, like you said, they were, uh, I think, 15 and 14, and Ken Benson was a senior. But right. my plan was not to go there to be the center. I was planning to go there to be a four or a three because I could shoot the ball. I could run. I could jump. I could dribble. I could pass. But when I got there, Coach Knight put me right in the paint, he took away all the offensive skills I had. I went from averaging 25 points a game to 10 points a game, which was kind of depressing for me. But then again, I knew that I had to sacrifice my game for the betterment of the team to win. And so, but yeah, you're, you're so right. I could have, I could have gone to any of these schools and done exceptionally well. And, but I chose to go basically because my mother wanted me to stay in state. She begged me, please don't go out. Don't go out to stay. I want to see you play. And my dad didn't really care. He was just glad I was going somewhere <laughs> to get out the house. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were part, you were part of a I, resurgence is too big a term because IU really only had kind of one down year. And that was 77 that you mentioned Benson's senior <laughs> year. And Benson was, Either I don't remember off my top of my head if he was player of the year, but I do remember he was the overall number one draft pick that right. particular year. But but your class and the two or three classes that came afterwards, along with, with Mike Woodson, who was a year ahead of you, mm-hmm. started an incredible run of IU basketball for basically 78-79 uh, your freshman year was 77, 78, but 78, 79 through 83, IU had a terrific record, not only in the Big Ten, but obviously the national championship in 1981. When you joined IU and then the classes came behind you, Isaiah Thomas, Ted Kitchell, Randy Whitman, and of course, I want to mention uh, IPS kid Landon Turner. Right. You as a basketball player – how did you feel when all that talent started to accumulate on your team and you're like, okay, we've got a chance to do some amazing things? Well, excellent question. Um, you know, going back to my, my freshman year, 
we had a, a good recruiting um, we had of course Phil Eisenberger, Steve Risley, myself, Tommy Baker from Jeffersonville. Um, you know, we had Eric Kirshner. So we, we had a good crop of guys coming in. Um, but it, it took for some reason it just took us a minute to gel. But we had Mike Woodson, like you said the year before, Mike Woodson, Butch Carter. We had a guy named Jim Robertson who was a little older. Um, Scott Hill. Um, we, we we had a pretty good crop of guys, but once the next year came in, like you said, uh, when uh, we had like Landon Turner and the, the, the Indianapolis guys, I call them the Indianapolis crew. You got Kitchell, Whitman, you had like, Landon. <clears throat> those those guys came in that really kind of helped us out. But of course, Landon had some issues because he wasn't really serious about it at at the time. But Whitman and Kitchell really helped us out a lot. And by the time we got Isaiah, I mean, yeah, I, I was very happy with the group. Um, you know, my sophomore and junior year, we, we, we had, well, actually, when, when Isaiah was a freshman, we were pretty good. When he was a sophomore, we were pretty good. Isaiah was a special talent. And then when once Knight realized what he had, he kind of let the reins go a little bit, so to speak. I think we had more fun, but he was still – you know, strict, and, and we had to make five passes unless it was a layup. We had a motion offense. We had set like fifteen different screens. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it, it, it was uh, it was fun, especially in my senior year when we were playing in the NCAA tournament. And we had won like like nine straight games or something like that going into the tournament uh, in the Big Ten. We uh, started excelling, and Landon Turner finally got a spark and he really realized that I was a senior Isaiah was a sophomore he had talked about leaving early Landon said let me get my act together because these two guys are going to be gone I'm going to be here you know pretty much on my own with you know with these other guys and he was like let me go to work and so once once we got rolling after we even won we lost nine games that season we still felt like we should have won a lot of those games but you know, that, that, that's the maturation process, the, the growing pains, wins and losses, and things you should have done better, you could have done better. But it, it, it's all a learning process. And so by the time my senior year came, you know, we, of course we won it. And, and because if you think about it, <clears throat> from from the 78, we, we got to the tournament. 79, you know, we got to the NIT. 80, we got to the tournament, lost to Purdue in Kentucky. And then 81, we won it. So those four years were very prevalent. We won two Big Ten championships. We won an NIT, well, for me, an NIT championship. So it was good. But by the time I graduated, Landon you know, had the accident that really devastated everybody. But like you said, Winston Morgan, Stu Robinson, Uwe Blob, some other guys, I can't remember the years exactly, but they had some good teams. Like you said, all the way up to 87. So, um, IU did pretty good, and and at the same time, Purdue was doing good. All the Big Ten was getting better. Even even Northwestern was getting better because we used to smash Northwestern, but everybody kept improving. So the Big Ten started to get a good reputation about being a tough league. So I'm glad that we had something to do with that, you know. But uh, sure. it was always it's always fun to see and, and, and you know go back and watch some college games and watch Indiana, watch Purdue, watch Big Ten, Ohio State. I watch those guys do well because I, I, I enjoy Big Ten basketball. Even to this day, I still enjoy Big Ten basketball. Even though we had the pandemic and all this stuff, it's kind of sad to see what's happening in the country. But then again, we're going to get better. Everybody's going to get better. We live and learn. But well, uh, you I mentioned, enjoy basketball. You mentioned yeah. your freshman year. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. I'm done. Yeah. Your, your freshman year – uh, you made it back to the NCAA. Then mm-hmm. your sophomore year, you went to the NIT, yeah. which used to be a huge tournament. And it's, I'm not denigrating it, but it, it used no, to no. be as big as the NCAAs. And then, you know, I think probably a lot of it because of the UCLA dynasty in the 60s and 70s, the NCAA mm-hmm. tournament started mm-hmm. to really take off. But your sophomore year, IU doesn't do as well as the freshman, as your freshman year in the Big Ten. Right. But you win the NIT and you beat Purdue. What yeah. was that game like, and how much pressure was there to beat 
Purdue, well, especially. To, to go back even further, we had to play Ohio State the first game. Ohio State was tough. Her Williams, Clark Kellogg, they had Jim Smith. You know, they had Todd Penn, and then you had Kevin Ramsey. I mean, Ohio State probably had the best talent of everybody in the Big Ten at that time, in my in my opinion. And then we beat them. We scratched by and got by them. Butch Carter from Ohio, from, from uh, Middletown, Ohio, I guess he had, you know, something to say about those games. And then um, that was tough. We got through that. But, but Purdue, man, Joe Berry, Jerry Seastein, Arnett Hallman, Mike Scares. I mean, these guys were tough, and uh, they knew everything. They were Gene Cady had those guys just as I think it was Gene was it Lee Lee Rose, Gene Cady, one of the people. It was Lee Rose. Go ahead. It was Lee Rose. Yeah. So you know, I'm getting old, enjoying my age here. But yeah, Lee Rose was tough, man. He had he had a great team. He was well prepared, and and it, believe it or not, if you go back and watch that game. When Bush Carter hit that shot with about three or four seconds to go in the game, Purdue ran an out of bounds play that was perfect, and Jerry Ceasing was wide open in the left corner, and we were like, "Oh crap!" <laughs> 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 and when he shot the ball, man, it looked good. And then the ball bounced up just right off the way from the rim. I just slapped it down. Of course, and nobody's getting the tip on me. It's not going to happen. So, now, of course, we celebrated, but man, I mean. Purdue could have easily won that game. And so I always give credit to where credit is due. I mean, Purdue played tough. They, they could, I think, I think maybe, I don't know if the Walker, the Walker boys was on that team at the time. I remember Jerry C. Singh, Brian Walker, Steve Walker. I think it was Brian Walker. Uh, is perhaps home. your, is perhaps your most memorable game from the 78 79 season? the overtime victory against Kentucky in Assembly Hall. I mean, that's IU-Kentucky games. They don't play anymore. It's been a few years, obviously. But if if you're of a certain age, uh, the the Christian Watford shot stands out, obviously. And I'm sure you were cheering (laughs) like crazy for that. And I I, I was happy for him, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) IU's victory over Kentucky a few years later in the NCAA tournament in the Sweet 16 or maybe the second round to get to the Sweet 16. Uh, when Kentucky had a terrific team. But in the 70s and 80s, the IU-Kentucky rivalry was Mm. the biggest in the country. You played some memorable games against them. Did you feel an extra sense of hype for those games? Like I'm I'm sitting here looking in uh, 1978, IU beats Kentucky 68-67. Kentucky is the sixth-ranked team in the United States. IU isn't ranked. Are you able to recall specific games like that, or are they just oh, kind yeah. of all a blur? Well, if, if you go back, uh, the, the, the year before, I think it was my freshman year, we played in um, we played in Kentucky, uh, down in Lexington at Rupp Arena. They had a guy by the name of Jack Goose Gibbons. Yeah, player of the Goose, year. Goose, yeah, he was a lefty. I think he only missed one shot that game. I mean, I, I, as high as I could jump, I remember timing his shot perfectly. And for some reason, I don't know how he did it. He held that shot back like Larry Bird did and just <laughs> knocked it in. I'm like, oh, crap, we are in trouble. <laughs> but, yeah, they had a big, big John Roby. Uh, I think his name was Mike Phillips. They, they, those guys' front line was huge. They, they, was, they was feeding those guys corn in the morning. Those guys were huge. <laughs> and so, you know, and they had, um, of course, let me see. I mean, so many great players. I don't want to get into all these name calling. But, yeah, there's so many great players there. And when, when that game, when that game, when we lost that game, I knew the importance of the Kentucky-Indiana rivalry. And I said to myself, next year when we play them at home, we're going to be ready. But if you recall, we, we had a big storm of, of things happened to our team where four, four guys were put on – well, five guys were put on indefinite probation and three guys were kicked off the team because of drugs and hearsay and whatever. And so – but we only had like eight players. We had to practice with guys uh, coming from the intramural league to, to practice with us, you know. Really? <laughs> so, Yes, yes. So it was tough. 
it was tough. My my sophomore year, we had uh, a, a lot of things that happened, and then uh, we had to really work hard at getting back to where we belong. And then when we beat Kentucky, they had Kyle Macy. Um, I, I don't. I think Sam Bowie may have. No, no, it wasn't Sam Bowie. It was uh, Mel Turpin. Uh, well, yeah, Big Dinner Bell Mel was there. I believe he was there. Call him Dinner Bell Mel. Big Mel was huge. I think Sam Bowie may have – he may have been there. I'm not sure. He was a freshman. But um, they also had a guy um, – man, I can't think of his name. It'll come to me next week. <laughs> so, anyway, but uh, I don't think – I don't think uh, – oh, yeah, uh, Anderson. His name was Anderson. I uh, can't forget his first name. This kid was amazing. Uh, they, their guard play was amazing. White Anderson. And they, Dwight Anderson. Yes, I'm glad you're looking it up. Dwight Anderson was such an athlete, man. I don't know what happened to him. I don't know if it was drug, drugs or whatever. But this kid and, and Dirk Minifield, Dirk Minifield was another great player. These guys were like lightning. They were like Isaiah times two. And I'm like, man, where do these guys come from? You know, they had – so, so many good players. And we had to fight tooth and nail to win. They, they had, you had Cal Macy, who had transferred from Purdue down right. to Lexington. Cal Macy was the guy. You know, he was the man. They had a guy, I think Jim Masters was there after a couple of years. He went from Indiana and went to Kentucky. So when guys when guys from Indiana, like, go to Kentucky, man, we – we just want to send a message, you know. <laughs> but but these guys were tough, man. The kid out of Maryland, James Blackman, he was tough. I mean, you know, these guys later on after I played, but but you know, if, if you if you get the chance to do something great and you want to choose the college of your choice, well, you have that right. But they they catch a lot of flack when they come to Bloomington or Purdue, man. But anyway, and, and deservedly, um, yeah, those rivalries were so. tough. Yeah, <laughs> those, You're, those rivalries were were number one. Purdue, IU, and uh, when we finally, it felt so good to win that game, and then I realized how important it was. And then when I lost to Kentucky my senior year against Sam Bowie, um, man, that 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 still haunts me to this day. But fortunately, we won the national championship. And what happened? Um, I believe it was um, Alabama, Birmingham beat Kentucky to play us in the Mideast Regional that year in Bloomington. So we really had to send a message to Alabama Birmingham, which I think was the toughest team that we played in the whole entire tournament in 81 was Alabama Birmingham. They were that good, man. Your junior year, you it, it was interesting. IU wins the Big Ten outright. Mm-hmm but loses in the NCAA tournament to Purdue, which yeah. had to have, I bet Coach Knight was thrilled. <laughs> if, if he only but that's the freshman the, year the of Isaiah Thomas. <laughs> yeah. So Isaiah Thomas comes your junior year, his freshman year. Now IU is starting to get loaded. Isaiah Thomas, Jim Thomas, Randy Whitman, right. Ted Kitchell, you, Landon Turner, Butch Carter, I've read interviews and seen interviews with Isaiah Thomas and Isaiah Thomas still has a look of disappointment that Mike Woodson's career ended how it did. Do you feel that same way? Absolutely. Uh, Okay. here's, Here's the inside scoop on some of that. When Mike Woodson hurt his back, he was hurt at the same time. Randy Whitman got hurt. Glenn Gronwald was hurt. We had about three or four key components were, with injuries. And then, you know, we had to scrap and fight and, to get where we were. But had, had Mike Woodson, if he was healthy, had not had the back surgery, I really believe that the game against Purdue down in Lexington would have been different. But because he came back, we felt like, we wanted him back early so bad because he was that good. But I don't think Mike was 100%. He was probably around 75 80%. <clears throat> but he came back anyway. We were happy that he did. But at the end, going into the tournament, you could tell that Mike was struggling because he was declining because his back just wouldn't hold out. 
And, and Isaiah and I had talked about, man, if Woody was, was if Woody was 100%, we would have, you know, things would have been different. And so, yeah, it was kind of disappointing to us uh, because we were not uh, at full tilt 100%. Had we been 100%, we would have, I believe, this is just me, I believe we would have been in that Final Four. We would have eventually won that game. Because That's you were awesome. preseason number one that year. Yes, sir. One game I want to ask you about before we get on to your senior year and talk about the tournament is a game that I can kind of remember. I was born in 67, so I would have been 12. Sorry, Ray. When this game. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> when this game happened. And, and it's it's something that if you grew up during the time period, I always say one of the one of the greatest things that ever happened to me, surely by coincidence, was being a kid growing up in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it was the best time to grow up. I, I can't imagine that any time would have been better. I, I'm very, and my peers were all very lucky to be kids of the 70s and kids of the 80s. But the last game of the Big Ten season in 1980, you're 13th in the country. You have to travel to Ohio, or excuse me, Ohio State has to travel to Assembly Hall. And it's basically a one-game playoff for the outright Big Ten championship. Exactly, yes. IU wins in overtime, 76-73. I can't necessarily say I remember the game, but I remember reading about the game. To play Ohio State, Coach Knight's alma mater, one game for the outright Big Ten championship at Assembly Hall, Prior to the NCAA tournament in 81, maybe the Final Four, was that the biggest game you had played in? Um, I, for, for me, I, I felt like every game was important. But, yeah, as far as the importance of winning the Big Ten outright against a great team of Ohio State, and plus, like you said, being Bobby Knight's alma mater, um, it was important to us. And because you no, know, like you know, Woody was a hundred percent. Butch Carter was a hundred percent. I was a hundred percent. And the only thing that was missing was that Landon Turner was not a hundred percent, but he was more like in the doghouse here and there. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but yeah, but Landon did get a chance to play because when he got in the game with me, you know, we had a bigger size and we we matched up better with um, Ohio State. But Steve Risley did a great job. Ted Kitchell did a great job. But athletically speaking, you know, uh, Landon and I were, were a little bit better in, on the athletic side. But 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 Steve Risley and Ted Kitchen were tough as nails, man. They 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 went in there and they played hard. You know, everybody played hard. Glenn Gronwald, who had a, a bad knee, he had knee surgery. And but Glenn was people don't realize Glenn Gronwald was tough. This kid could really play, but when he hurt his knee, it just it just devastated everybody. But um, getting to that game, you know, we were going back and forth. You know, Ohio State up by six. We got a chance to go up by four or five or six. And uh, I really didn't I really didn't get going until it seems like the, the last five minutes of the game in overtime because I could run all day. I never got tired. You know, if you notice in a lot of our games, I would play 40 minutes a game. I very seldom came out unless I was in foul trouble. And I tried not to get in foul trouble because I just like to play that much. And, um, but when we, we hit those big shots in overtime, I hit one jump shot in overtime. I think I got a, a, a and one or whatever. And, uh, we were able to beat Ohio, Ohio State. Clark Kellogg had a great game, uh, too. I mean, Clark, Clark was tough. Herb was tough. And, but to win that game the way we did and the way that people came onto the court and celebrated, that, that gave us a, a great indication of how good that we could really be. And so we kind of took that and, and ran with it, you know. Uh, the, the fuel was lit, and then so we just kept going. And so it was a great feeling to beat a great team from Ohio, his alma mater, the importance of winning the Big Ten outright you know, instead of being a tie or, or, or getting second place. We got first place and to get us a better position to the NCAA. And then to lose like we did to our rivals up north and west left. Yeah, it was tough, of course. But, you know, we got them in the 79, they got us in 80, and we came back in 81. So it was, just, it was just a back and forth thing. So, like I said, every team was tough. Every team was good. So you had to play your best A game 
every game in the Big Ten. So that was the importance of staying in shape, staying healthy, staying committed, staying prepared. So Coach Knight did that for us. So we were very fortunate to have that. Yeah. 1980-81. So previous year, Isaiah Thomas comes, several other really good recruits. Mike Woodson leaves, but the core of the team is still there. Randy Whitman, Landon Turner, Ray Tolbert, Jim Thomas, Isaiah Thomas, Steve Risley, Mike LaFave, Ted Kitchell, Phil Eisenberger, Glenn Grunewald, Chuck Franz, Tony Brown, and Steve yeah. Bushy. And Ooh, that, yeah. team, <laughs> that team famously started out is it seven and five and yes, had some – I'm going to look it up here so I get it correctly. You lose by two at Assembly Hall to Kentucky, who was ranked number two in the country. Yes. Are you are you still mad about that? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Three if, days if later, about, yeah. you traveled to Notre Dame, who was ranked yeah. number nine, and you lose by four points. About two weeks, a little less than two weeks, you travel to North Carolina, ranked number eight, and you lose yeah. by nine points. So you play three rivalry games almost. You lose all three. You go to what was called the Rainbow Classic, which I quite frankly didn't remember. Uh, oh, I do. <laughs> and because it is, I don't think it was still, it's famous, I think, the tournament where Chaminade beats Virginia with Ralph Sampson, which is considered one of the greatest upsets in college sports. Yeah. But so, yeah. so at the end of 1980, you're seven and five, having just lost to Texas Pan American in oh, Honolulu. Like yeah. The following week, you start the Big Ten season famously it's been said that Knight took the reins off of Isaiah and let him do his thing is that true and if it's true what effect did that have on you as a player well all the all the teams that you mentioned you know going back to you know, going back to Notre Dame, they had Kelly Chapuka, Orlando Warriors, Tracy Jackson. And, you know, we felt like we should have won that game. And then to go to North Carolina to lose by, I think it was either 9 or 15, 9. Um, of course, you know, you got Sam Perkins. You got Jimmy Black. My God, James Worthy. I mean, these guys were, were pros, pros, you know. And we felt like we had them. But then again, you know, like I said, you can't beat the stripes. When the stripes are making calls against you, you just got to roll with the punches. And then um, I'm sure every fan of a team other than IU is laughing at the fact that an IU player is complaining about the referees, considering how many times <laughs> <laughs> IU got great calls because of night in the hall. Yes. Yeah. Oh, boy. If but that doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> if you get a chair thrown at you, if you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we we were so prepared. The thing about what we did um, that made us different from a lot of other teams, you know, we had to write notes in our notebooks and stuff. We had to go and study. We would watch film like crazy, and you know, we had to uh, <clears throat> be prepared when questions were asked. What's our assignments individually, collectively? We had to know all that and because we hated that kind of preparedness, but it made us better. And so we got used to it. It's like, it's, it's like, you know, being in the military, you know, when you got to get up at a certain time, you got to do a certain regimen. And, but that's what we did. And, uh, but going back to that seven and five, man, that was tough. That was tough because we felt like, again, those games that we could have, should have won. But, I always say trials come to make you strong. So it just prepared us for what was to come. So, you know, there, there are games where we felt like we should have won, we could have won, but then again, losing to, in 1980, 81, uh, you know, I guess it was, you said the, the Rainbow Classic. Uh, I don't, you, did you have a list of the name of teams that was there? I think you mentioned. Was it, well, you I beat Rutgers and we that lost basketball the powerhouse. And then you lost to, Clemson, which I think had Larry Nance, you mentioned yeah. that earlier, and then you lost to, 
Texas Pan American. Pan American. Ouch. Pan American. They had a guy by the name of Kenny Green. Kenny Green was about 6'8", 268, couldn't <laughs> jump, couldn't jump nowhere, but could score on anybody. I mean, we, we didn't really – I think we were so upset by losing to Clemson, we wasn't really focused on Pan American. And I think uh, Kenny Green, I think his name was uh, Green. I know his last name was Green. He had about maybe 21, 25 points or so. I can't remember. But, man, everything he threw up went in. I'm like, man, who is this dude? And so uh, that really made our bus ride a, a flight home. <laughs> yeah, that's a long flight. Very difficult. <laughs> you know, Knight wouldn't let us eat. You know, he was. <laughs> you better eat nothing. You don't deserve to eat. <laughs> like, oh my goodness, man! But after Knight the big, did... after the pre Big Ten season, you're seven and five. Mm-hmm. You proceed to go fourteen and four in the Big Ten, win it outright by a game over Iowa, I believe. Again, right. you lose at Purdue, I think, by two yeah. or three. Never, and never won at Purdue. Never won there. <laughs> that's interesting. You still remember that. You never won at Purdue. You beat Eight Purdue. Games. You just never won at Mackey. Ne- never lost at IU. Never won at Mackey. That's right. You head into the NCAA tournament. You go from completely unranked in seven and five. You enter mm-hmm. the tournament a three seed ranked ninth and you put together you and your teammates put together a run in the NCAA tournament that quite frankly is underrated. Mm. You beat Maryland by 35 points on a team that I think included Albert King and Buck Williams, Charles Pittman, um, Manning had a kid named a guard named Manning. Um, They had Ernest Graham, all these four, I think seven out of those seven out of those twelve players went pro that year. The second round, you play University of Alabama Birmingham, win by fifteen. Yep. Yes. The next game is against Saint Joseph Saint of Joe. Pennsylvania, right? Who beat number one DePaul early? That's right. Yeah, that's right. They, one of the great yep. great upsets of all time. You beat right. them by 32. Hello. You make- <laughs> so you go, ironically, <laughs> ironically, you go back to the spectrum, and IU fans will recall that the 32-0 and 76 team won its national championship at the spectrum in Philadelphia. Correct. Making it to the Final Four, Coach Knight's first trip since 1976, when you got there, did you feel like you were playing as well as anyone? You were being coached by the best coach in the country. You had perhaps the best player in the country and Isaiah Thomas on your team. How confident were you all as a team and you personally heading into that Final Four? Um, actually, I mean, when you get that far, you're very confident. You know, like you said, we had won so many games at the latter part of the Big Ten, and we were pretty much blowing teams away. Um, You know, when we played Maryland, we knew that that was going to be a tough game. But, but believe it or not, when when we got down eight to nothing, Knight never believed in calling the first timeout, and so I I don't know if it was a television timeout or whatever, what media timeout. And Knight said, okay, they, they think that we can't run. So what we're going to do, we're going to run. And, man, I can remember looking at two other faces smiling real big. It was Landon <laughs> Turner and Isaiah Thomas. Of course, I was already smiling. I said, now they're going to see what we can do. And they even Ted Kitchell and poor Randy. He, Randy tried to run with us. <laughs> <laughs> And so after after we got the running up and down the court, man, I said, you know what? This is my senior year, and I'm just going to start shooting like I did back in high school. I just started stroking the jump shot. Everything was going in. Isaiah was making – he had like 18 assists. Landon was going well. I was doing well. Ted, everybody played well that game. And that – when we beat 
Maryland the way we did, that really built our confidence. And we found out that, of course, St. Joe's had beat uh, DePaul. We were like, man, these guys are making it easier for us. <laughs> so, but by the time we got to, of course, Alabama, Birmingham, like you said, and St. Joe's, we, we sent those messages and we got to the final four. We felt like, you know, not really being invincible, but we were very dedicated. We felt, we felt very confident that we could beat anybody. And, and that, um, and that but, North Carolina team, you know, famously the next year, they recruit a kid named Michael Jordan. So the, the next year, North oh, Carolina wins. It's oh, that, that's who it was? <laughs> he made a little yeah. bit of a difference. Of course, it would be remiss of me to uh, not point out that IU subsequently then ended Michael Jordan's college career a couple of years later in that great upset in Atlanta. But the North Carolina team in 1981 had three first-round draft picks, Al Wood, James Worthy, Sam Perkins. Yeah. So it's not like you you may have gotten a break with St. Joseph, but you have to go up against North Carolina, a team that had beaten you earlier in the year, a team with amazing talent, clearly one of the best coaches in the history of sports and Dean Smith. Talk to us a little bit about the preparation for that game, the mentality going into that game and and what coach Knight was like preparing you for the national championship game. Okay. But, but remember, before we played North Carolina, we had to play LSU. Dale right. Brown was the coach. He was a great, great coach. They had a guy named Rudy Macklin. Um, they had, <clears throat> well, I, I just named one. Rudy Macklin was a great player. And they had some other kids, um, Big Cook, his name was Cook. They had a guy named, um, well, anyway, these guys were probably just as good athletically, if not better, than Alabama Birmingham. They were that good, and we beat them. I, I struggled my last two games, to be honest with you. I struggled offensively. Um, Landon had a good game. Of course, of course, Whitman and, and Kitchell and, and Turner had great games, but I, I, I just had to focus defensively. And uh, <clears throat> But we had to really work hard at that game. But I think getting to the final game, I, I think at, at, at one point, though, um, I, I really believe that we had – over try to overlook LSU because we want to get back at North Carolina because they beat us earlier, like you said. But right. once we got past LSU, then our focus became on North Carolina, and we were ready for that game. But unfortunately, that's the same at the same period. Uh, President Ronald Reagan was shot. That's right. I was going to ask you about that. Reagan yeah. is shot in front of the Washington yeah. Hilton earlier in the day. The game yeah. is in limbo. It, it becomes clear that night, excuse me, that night, obviously I want Bobby Knight to be president of the United States, that <laughs> president, <laughs> president Reagan is going to recover from his wounds. And so it's decided that the game is played. Uh, how did that throw a wrench into your preparation? You're all hop, hyped up during the day. Can't wait to get the game over. And then it's right. possible that it, you don't even going to play it. Right. Well, here, here, here's the scenario. When, when, this, when that happened, Coach Knight was very adamant about not having the game. And he, you know, he, of course, you know, he's, he's such a, a, a political stru- a, 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 a guy. He's very, very known into uh, knowing the history. Well, of, he's a history politics. buff for sure. Yes, sir. And uh, he was very adamant about not having the game. But what we didn't know, truthfully, we we had a we heard that once President Reagan was going to be okay, uh, Knight felt better about it. But what we didn't know was uh, President Reagan was still in in dire straits because uh, they wanted the country to know that he was okay to make us all feel better, and that that we wouldn't really you know really want to just say being selfish about the game and then sure. once we realized and we heard that it was he was going to be okay he was going to survive and get through it we all felt better about it nobody wants to see anybody get shot and, and for whatever you know president reagan was, was a, a great man we all knew that but uh so to, to actually play the game we were sitting in the locker room that we like you said we had prepared we were ready we were fired up and then we, we were very, we were very uncertain that the game was going to go on or not. But Coach Knight came busting through the doors. Okay, boys, 
get ready. We're going to play. And we were like, okay. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we're talking about. Because we wanted to get in North Carolina, man. We wanted to get into them. And then when it first started out, you know, of course, you know, North Carolina jumped out on us again because, you know, we were trying to, you know, make up for uh, the first game. But we knew what we had to do. But for some reason, man, I, I just could not put the ball in the basket. But at night, had called me over. This is true. He says, Tobert, you take one more shot, and you're going to watch this win the championship from the bench. <laughs> and remember, I told you back in day one, he never lied. <laughs> I took that to heart, and I said, well, okay, i just focus on defense. And if I get a tip in or whatever, get a rebound, put back dunk, that'll be fine with me. But um, I ended up with 11 boards, and I think the uh, – a great person by the name of James Worthy only had seven points. So I, I can brag about that, I guess. I don't know. But, yeah, but we were very, very prepared. We were very ready to play. And, um, of course, the outcome was victorious, and we uh, celebrated. And it was my senior year to go out on top like that was a great feeling. But then again, getting drafted to the NBA, man, <laughs> all those guys we beat, I had to face him again. <laughs> well, let me but, yeah, it, it was a great about, time. Yeah. About yeah. IU's. We have just a few minutes left, and we want to give sure. you a couple minutes at the end uh, to talk about your ministry and your work. But okay, one of the things I wanted to ask you is you win in 81. The 76 team and then the 75 team are obviously hollowed – uh, rosters and achievements in the history of IU basketball. You win in 81, fast forward six years, Alford and Daryl Thomas and, and Todd Meyer and Keith Smart, and Dean Garrett and that group win in 87. Mm -hmm. Did you looking when you won in 81, did you look at the 76 team and say, Hey, we've continued the legacy of championships. And when you saw the players from 1987, who were then national championships, were you like, thank you? You know, we're a special group now. The 76, the 81, the 87 teams were a special collection of people who know what it's like. Yeah, I mean, very quickly, I, I had a, a few years ago, I had lunch with Quinn Buckner. And Quinn said, I said, man, it must have been great going 32 and 0. Actually, you know, like 31 and one the, the year before they only lost right. one game in two years. He says, even though those were great times, he said the most, the thing I was most, uh, most proud of is when we, we, we went, we went undefeated in the big 10 and two years that, in a row. That, I, I, yeah. I was like, wow. And nobody, I, I never heard that from any other player, but Quinn Buckner, Quinn was different, man. Quinn, Quinn was special. And I, I felt proud he still about is that. special. He's a he's a, a a good friend and a, a terrific terrific guy. We'd love to have him yes, on the he podcast. Is. Yes, he's great. And whenever I would call Quinn or text Quinn or, or contact Quinn, he would always get back with me right away. Quinn is that type of person. I always try to be like Quinn. But getting back to what you said, eighty one, eighty seven, I was so proud of of the eighty, of course the seventy five, seventy six team. Very proud of them. I was proud of what we did, of course. And in the 87 team, I was proud. And then again, I believe it was when Jared Jeffries and um, Sean May uh, were playing, uh, they got to the Final Four, if I, if I recall that. They Jared Jeffries and Jeff Newton. We actually, uh, one of our previous yeah. podcast guests is a, a former uh, fellow Mr. Basketball, Tom Coverdale, who was on Coverdale, that team yeah. that, that yeah. lost to Maryland in the final game. Let me ask Why? you quickly. I was just getting out of basic training and was stationed at Fort Ben Harrison when oh. IU beat Syracuse. Mm -hmm. What were you doing and how did you react when Keith Smart hit that shot? <laughs> I, I, I don't really remember. I think I was um, 87. I was in, I think I was in Los Angeles at the time. Uh, either, I playing was for the Lakers. York. Yeah, I was either in New York with the with the Knicks, or I was in in, in L.A. with the Lakers. And then <clears throat> when Derek Coleman missed those free throws and stuff like that, and then I think it was Ron Sykley, uh They had a great team, of course. You know, yeah, Kirk they did. That's on defense, but then 
when when we ran the motions, everybody was looking for Steve Alford to, to knock the shot down. I guess they all keyed on Steve Alford. Then when, when Keith got the shot in the corner, took one dribble, he could jump out the gym, obviously. When he, when he shoots the jump shot, man, he's 10 feet in the air. And when he let that baby go, and then when it went in, now I think we all jumped up and said, yes! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, everybody was, of course, everybody was excited. I'm, I'm sure all of Big Ten was excited. I'm sure the people in New York were devastated, but I mean, I mean, I mean, the way they celebrated, and even Key Smart being in, you know, New Orleans from a New Orleans kid, you know, from Louisiana, to hit that shot like that was great, and uh, I, I was so proud of them, like any other IU team that that does well. I, I believe it or not, I, I really root for two teams, IU and Purdue. Only when Purdue plays IU, I had to root for IU. <laughs> so, but yeah, man, I, I, I love basketball. I appreciate what they're doing. I appreciate what the Big Ten is doing and representing his, history and, and us putting those banners up there. Every time I get a chance to look at a game or go down to Bloomington and look up at those Raptors and see 81, it, it, it's always a great feeling. Yeah. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, and Grain Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. We are talking to Big Ten champion, Indiana Mr. Basketball, national champion, and first-round draft pick, Ray Tolbert, a forward on and captain on IU's 1981 national championship team. Before we wind up the podcast, Ray, please take a minute or two to talk about what you're doing now and how the listeners – the Leaders and Legends podcast can be helpful? Well, um, right now, um, I'm in ministry. I, I am an associate pastor <clears throat> here at Miracle Faith Temple in Anderson, Indiana. It's a small family church. Um, and we're located on 15, 1501 Hendrick Street off of Madison Avenue in Anderson, Indiana. Uh, I've been in the ministry now going on 20 years. Um, but I also, what I, what I specialize in, of course, is training, basketball training. You can go to TolbertBasketball.com, and it'll give you some information. And because of the pandemic and everything that's happening, unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to really, you know, get involved during the March Madness and stuff like that, which I usually do, speaking engagements. And I, I do ministry. I do speaking engagements. I speak for groups, corporations, uh, whoever would like to have me to, to get a positive message across. That's what I do, and um, I do one-on-one -on -one training. I do group training. Um, if anybody's out there looking for somebody who can um, assist me in that way, maybe make a donation or something, that's fine. I'd be, I, I accept all donations. <laughs> well, <laughs> the Leaders and Legends podcast is going to make a donation uh, to you this week, Ray. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that very much. And um, to all, all the sponsors that you named, Thank you all for, for helping you out, what you're doing, a great job with your podcast. And, um, you know, whatever I can do to, to help you come back again and speak, I'd be more happy to. Also, I'm, believe it or not, I'm writing a book. I, I, haven't have a, I, I don't have a title yet, but I do have a, a, a previous book out. It's called Transform. Um, I, I have a book with seven other guys who give testimonies. It's called Transform. You can go to Amazon or uh, all the outlets out there. The, the book is out there called Transform. Uh, the guy's name is Terrell Sauber. He's the guy who actually, it's, called, uh, it's a company called B Men, hashtag B Men Incorporated. So just go to hashtag B Men Incorporated. It'll give you all the information about what we're doing and the book that is, that's coming out that I'm writing. Uh, I, I've just completed it. We just got to figure out a title for it. And believe it or not, there's a lot about Bobby Knight in it. <laughs> <laughs> let, me so ask, that, that, let me ask you one final question before we sure. let you go. You mentioned Bobby Knight. You mentioned writing a book. Um, I asked this question of Gene Cady, of Coach mm. Gene Cady, and he, God love him, he was so terrific. He answered it. So I'll ask you, did you read the book, A Season on the Brink? And if so, what did you think of it? I don't think I've read all of it. I started reading it, but I don't have the book 
um, per se, but I think I can go. I can go online and read it. But uh, I think I have. I can't remember really. Um, I've read bits and pieces of it, but I'm sure it's a good book because it's probably one of the number one bestsellers for a while. But I, honestly, I can't say I did. I, I read the entire book, but I did hear stories about the book. So I can't. I can't really. Uh, say that I have read the book. I should <laughs> to kind of get some comparisons of what I'm doing. But yeah, I, I did read part bits and pieces of the book, but not the whole entire book. Well, if you if you read the book, and anyone who has read the book, you can form your own opinion. But what comes out of it clearly is how much Coach Knight loves Ray Tolbert. Wow. And enjoyed coaching him and that I team. I never read that. Yeah. And what that team represented. Uh, Ray Tolbert was really the first IU player I can remember because of the way he played. I remember the 76 team, but the 1981 team is special in so many ways. Ray, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. We'll be sure to make that donation. And please stay in touch and let me know if there's ever anything I can do for you. Robert, thank you so much, 100%. God bless you guys. Thank you for inviting me on, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. 